faith that's going to change your world, change this nation, change Europe, and change the planet. Amen? God has chosen you, ordinary you, to be a wealth builder. He's chosen you to just, oh man, it's just awesome. We ended up halfway through looking at Abraham, didn't we, last week? He was looking for cities whose foundations were designer and builder of the God. He was heavenly minded. You know, the more we look to heaven, the more we realize that we're going to spend eternity in heaven, the more effective we become on planet Earth. Because we don't let little things bother us anymore. We don't let minor inconveniences. Paul talks about all the persecution he had, beaten with sticks, being stoned, left for dead, shipwrecked. He said it's a light inconvenience compared to the weightiness of the glory I'm going to have for all eternity. But look what happens next. Sarah, by faith, verse 11, Hebrews 11, 11, by faith Sarah herself received power to conceive. See, one of the greatest things that living a life of faith will do for you is it enables you to receive power. Living by faith enables you to receive power. Now, in Sarah's case, it was power to conceive. Because the promise on Sarah's life, what God promised her, was a baby. And so she had the promise of a baby, but she did not have the power to conceive a baby. But by faith, she received that power. So what's the promise of God on your life? What has God promised you? And if you don't know yet, and you don't know your specific calling, your specific destiny, and you haven't realized the hope that God's put on your life, well, let's just stick with the gen- generic stuff. Everyone in this room, healing is yours through Jesus Christ. By his stripes you were healed. That's the truth. That is what the word of God says. This Bible is truth. What you think, what you experience, what the world tells you, what auntie tells you, what some preacher on the TV tells you, may or may not be true, it has to line up with this. This is truth. Jesus' word is truth. And so the truth is, by his stripes you were healed. Well, I don't feel healed. We're not living on feelings, are we? I don't look healed. But we don't live by look by, do we? We live by faith. And faith looks at the word, and faith says, by his stripes I'm healed. That's the promise. And by faith I receive the power to manifest the promise. By faith, I receive the power to obtain wealth. By faith, I've seen the power to conceive. By faith, I receive the power to preach. By faith, I receive the power to make money. By faith, I receive the power to sleep through the night tonight and not wake up scared or frightened or ashamed or guilty. By faith, I receive the power to love my wife as Christ loves the church. By faith, I receive the power to submit to my husband. By faith, I receive the power to not embitter my children. What is the promise on your life? By faith, you receive the power. What do I mean by faith? This is what I've been trying to talk about for the last month. What I mean is this. You hope for it. You see the image. And then what do you do? You act on that image. And as you act, as you step out, the power is in the stepping out. We looked at that with Joshua just a few months ago. The priests had to step into the water for the water to roll back. It's amazing how many of us are at the edge of something amazing. You really are at the edge of walking into all of God's promises for your life. We're halfway through this year, the year of great overflow. We're literally now halfway through. Next week, I will be here next week, but I I will be here and I will be preaching, but I won't be. That's going to get your head messed up. Friday, I was in the recording studio, and I was
recorded 4 TV programs on faith, 3 on Hebrews 11, 1 on the woman with the issue of blood. And I also recorded while I was there a 45 minute message, TV program on unity. And we're going to show it next weekend at all six churches. And it's just one of those things that I believe is so important for us to walk in our destiny is the power of unity. And one of the things that really messes people up is division. And so I just talked on it. I just shared my heart for 45 minutes. And that's what we're going to play next week. We're going to play it in Watford. We're going to play it in Cambridge. We're going to play it in Croydon and Brentwood and Dagnon and Guildford. Everyone in the church is going to watch that message. Why I talk about unity and dealing with division. And I believe it's going to be really healthy and helpful for the network. But you see, crossing over is by faith. But Galatians says faith works by love. Faith works by love. A torch works by batteries. If the torch isn't working, we need to sort the batteries out because a torch works by batteries. Faith works by love. If the faith isn't shining, we need to look at the love because faith works by love. Are you with me here tonight? Now the good news good news that a lot of people forget, 1 John 4 verse 10, one of the most important scriptures in the Bible, because we've defined faith, haven't we? Faith is the substance of what I hope for. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. So how do we define love? 1 John 4 verse 10 defines love. It says, now this is love. That's the beginning of the definition of love now, aren't we? Now this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. You see, when we look at love in the Bible, if we then start looking at the love inside us, we're going to get messed up. Because every single one of you has failed to love people. Every single one of you has hurt people, has let people down. I'm not excluding myself here. We've all messed up in some way or another. But this is love, not our love for God, but his love for us. Faith works by love, and this is love, not our love for God, but his love for us. The more I realize how much he loves me, then my faith will work. And you can actually trace that in Sarah's life. That her whole life was coming to the place where she realized God loved her. Because she starts off, when God first says, you're going to have a baby, she laughs. Why did she laugh? It wasn't because she didn't believe God could make someone have a baby. And he, a drunk on the, uh, living under a bridge could believe that. But she didn't believe it worked on her. Because she didn't understand how much God loved her. And the more you come to a revelation of the unconditional, unfailing, unending love that God has for you, the easier it is to have faith. Why wouldn't he heal me? He adores me. Why wouldn't he give me the money I need to do what he's called me to do? Because he loves me. Why wouldn't he help me save my marriage? He is in love with me. By faith, Sarah received power to conceive. What do you need power to conceive? Start to believe it. Start to receive it right now before you even leave today. Start to receive that power. You see, the power is always in there. For some of you, you're not speaking in tongues yet. You say, well, I don't think tongues are all that important. That's because you don't speak in tongues. Don't have a discussion with me about how whether tongues are important if you don't speak in tongues. For me, if you don't speak in tongues, you don't understand the power of speaking. You don't have the right to, you know, it's amazing how many Christians say something like, well, do we have to speak in tongues? You don't have to speak in tongues. You get to speak in tongues. You know, when someone says to me, I'm a Christian, do I have to speak in tongues? To me, that's like saying, I'm a newlywed, do I have to have sex? Sorry, that was possibly a bit too crude. My, wa- 
my, my wife's in a Sunday school. I can't do it this way. No. <laughs> I got nobody looking going, oh, man. No. I heard Richard preach in Brentwood was it last week or the week before. Richard preached in Brentwood. And I watched Jackie do the same facial expression. <laughs> I thought, oh, wow. <laughs> I've watched Linda Parr do it when Wendell's preached. It's fantastic. It's awesome. Where were we? Faith, faith, faith. Even when she was past the age. So now listen to me. Faith does not limit itself to natural looks. Now here's the thing about Sarah. This Sarah was past the age to have children. But she couldn't have children when she wasn't past the age to have children. So really that's irrelevant to the story. It's amazing how many things we think are relevant that are not relevant. She couldn't have children anyway. She couldn't have children at 20, couldn't have children at 30, couldn't have children at 40, couldn't have children at 50. The fact she's now 90 doesn't really matter. Well, I can't do this for God because I'm too old. You can't get that from the Bible. Well, I'm too young. You can't get that from the Bible either. There's David as a teenage boy taking down Goliath. There's Mary as a teenage girl receiving her power to be healed. You didn't even know a man. (laughs) By faith, we can receive power to break natural laws. We are not limited by natural laws. Well, the doctors say this. Well, the problem with your doctor is this. Your doctor is carnal. I'm not saying anything rude. I know sometimes we think the word carnal is like lust and sex. And the word carnal just means to be moved by what you see and hear. That's all the word carnal means, to be limited by the natural realm. And doctors spend years of their life being trained as to what happens in the natural realm. And well, this happens in the natural realm, and this happens next, and this happens next. But by faith, Sarah received power to conceive being beyond age, not limited by natural law. Well, the doctor said, you can't have a baby at that age. But God said, I'm really not bothered by you. I don't live in the natural realm. I live in the spiritual realm. I'm above natural law. If you have faith, you're above natural law. There's a scripture that says, all things are possible. Now, in Matthew's gospel, it says, all things are possible to God. Matthew 17, all things possible to God. It's like good news, isn't it? Mark's gospel, Mark 9.23 says, all things are possible to him that believes. Do you realize that when you start having faith, you're not limited to human and natural law. You start moving in the same way God starts to move. You can do the things God does. You can pull people out of wheelchairs. You can heal the sick. You can have a baby when you're 90. (laughs) I didn't say you had to have. (laughs) How did she receive the power to break natural law? Since she considered him faithful who promised her. You see, this is something I think we have to realize. Is that when we have faith, it's not a measure about us. It's a measure of our trust in God. It's a measure of how well we know God. If I said to Sigma here, I said, Sigma, I like you. I really like you. But I have no faith in you. If you say something, I, I really don't want to do it. If you make a promise, I'm just going to keep it. You're being very rude, aren't you? And I'm not saying something about me. Oh, oh, I'm so humble. I'm so humble, I don't believe a word you say. I'm being rude. I'm showing my ignorance of the crowd. It isn't me. So how much more when someone says, well, I don't really have much faith in God. You're saying, I don't trust God to keep his promise. I don't trust God to do what he says he's going to do. God will do what he promised. 
By his stripes you are healed. My God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Well, I don't really believe that. Well, you're being rude to God. You're not showing off how humble you are. You're being rude to God. You see, Sarah realized that God said it. And when she realized that God said it, and she realized that God keeps his promises, and God keeps his word. And how did she realize that? I preached it here in May. Because Abraham and Sarah, Abraham entered into covenant with her. And Abraham became God's blood brother. And I don't want to re-preach that whole sermon. It's in Genesis 15. But God visits Abraham and says, I'm going to give you as many children as the stars in the sky. And Abraham goes, okay, sounds reasonable. And God said, I count that as righteousness. And then God gave Abraham a second promise and said, You're, this nation of Canaan, which became Israel, this country is yours and your descendants forever. And Abraham went, I, I, don't, know if I, I don't know if I can believe that. How can I know that? always amazes me when people get two different promises from the same God and they believe one and don't believe the other. I mean, people believe for healing but can't believe for financial prosperity. Or the other way around, they believe for finances but they can't believe in healing. You know? It's amazing. To people. Why the one promise and the other promise? I, I don't know why Abraham found the second promise harder to believe than the first promise. I think part of it was because there were people living in Canaan at the time. You know, if I said, picking on you today, because you're on the phone, I said, well, I'm going to give you a million pounds. Okay, I believe that, I believe that. I'm going to give you Aileen's house as well. <laughs> you go, hold on a minute. That's Aileen's house. You know, and so God said, I'm going to give you millions of children. Okay, I'll believe you, God. I'm going to give you the land of the Canaanites too. Hold on a minute, there's people living there. I, I don't know if that was part of it. That's the only thing I can think of. You know, when I look at it and think about it, I think, well, maybe that was Abraham saying, this guy's living there. You can't give me that land. It's, and God basically says, no, they're, 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 these guys have messed up too many times. They're, they're not gonna get, we're we're going to take that land. Okay, we'll take the land. But how can I know? And God didn't say to Abraham, oh, ye of little faith, get lost, I'll pick someone else. When God appeared to him in a vision and said, this is a promise, how can I know? Well, maybe because God said it. But God then tells him to get a cow and a goat and a dove. And, you know, like I said, I don't want to preach that message. But the, the long and short of it is that God and Abraham enter into a blood covenant with one another. And Abraham then realizes if God's in covenant with me, then if God says it, it's going to happen. That was the power of covenant. It was a, a, a well-known thing in that day and age. And so Sarah then realized if God's in covenant, God's faithful. And she realized. If you realize that God is in covenant with you, if you realize that God loves you, that God wakes up in the middle of the night like David woke up in the middle of the night, is there anyone of the house of Jonathan who I can bless? If David was in covenant with Jonathan, Jonathan was dead. So has he got any descendants I can bless? You see, Christ was blessed with everything, wasn't he? He was seated in heaven. He was blessed with everything. So the Father was going, is there anybody in Christ I can bless? Is there anyone in Christ I can give something to today? Is there anyone in Christ I can sit at the king's table to have dinner with me today? Is there anyone in Christ I can bless today? Is there anyone in Christ because I love them so much? This is love. I want to know I've got it today. And by faith in that love, Sarah received power to conceive, even when she was past the age because she considered him faithful to his promise. What do you consider God faithful to? He is faithful. Have we promised you? Well, it's impossible. Well, God's promising impossible, isn't it? If all you've got for your destiny, if all you've got in your mind for your future is possible things, you're dreaming too small. You're dreaming too small. Therefore, from one man and him good as dead. So it wasn't just Sarah had issues. Abraham had issues. And 
good as dead doesn't mean that he couldn't have a baby or he couldn't give a hundred. It meant he couldn't do the thing that makes you have a baby. He was a dead man. So I'm, if you can't get it from that, I'm not explaining it anymore. Therefore, from one man, him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised. Abraham never saw the millions of children of God. He never saw his seed, the seed of Abraham, Jesus Christ, walk on the earth. He never saw. You see, Abraham was given a promise, you're going to have descendants like the sand on the shore and the stars in the sky. Two sets of descendants, earthly descendants and heavenly. And so Abraham's earthly descendants are the Jewish people all over the planet. But Abraham also has heavenly descendants. Because when you're born again, he becomes your father. And you have to literally rock with your seal. And the blessing of Abraham is now yours. Not on merit, not on birthright, but on belief. Heavenly son of Abraham. And I am one of them and so are you. Let's all praise him. see everything that he was given. He was given his eyes too to see what he was given. And yet we're so good at that. You know, it's amazing. Some people, I think some people don't understand simple English words. But Hebrews 8 says that we have a better covenant. A better covenant than what Abraham had. A better covenant. If I said, and some of you have been around my house, if you've been in my house, my house has four bedrooms, has three bathrooms, has a study, it's a nice house. If I said, guys, God has blessed me, and the next week I'll move into a better house. And you came and saw me at my new house, and it had one bedroom, and all of us were in the same bedroom. And there was only half a bathroom. You would say, Ben, I don't think you understand the meaning of the word better. But it's amazing how many people think, well, yeah, in the Old Testament you could get healed. In the Old Testament you could prosper. But we're in the New Covenant now, and Jesus wants us to be poor and sick and little Sunday. You don't understand the meaning of the word better. It's the same blessing of Abraham. So why is it a better covenant? Because it's not by behavior, it's by belief. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. What's the curse of the law? The curse of the law is I have to behave in a certain way to earn the blessing. Well, you've been very good today. Here's the blessing. Well, you haven't been so good today. Here's, I'll take the blessing away. Because now the blessing of Abraham is freely available to the Gentiles, to the nations, to everyone who, not behaves, believes. That's a better deal. Here's all the blessings. Wealth, health, long life, peace of mind, freedom from shame. You can access the presence of God without fear or insecurity. Now you can have them one of two ways. Either you obey all 613 laws in the Old Covenant, or you believe in Jesus Christ as the Christ. You believe in your heart that he's risen from the dead, and you confess with your mouth he is a king. Which one's the better covenant? Come on now. And they, you see, they all died in faith, not having received the things promised. Not one of these guys saw what we have. We are living in the fulfillment of that. And yet we're so defeated and so wimpy Abraham had 318 people trained for war. Well, I saw that this week, and I'm looking at this and praying about it. I said, Lord, right, that is the church attendance I'm going for right now, 318. And I'm talking about warrior Christians. I'm not talking about wimpy. Oh, it was snowing today. I didn't go to church. Oh, I was a bit tired. I'm mad. No, I'm talking about people who lay hands on those with cancer, people who pull people out of wheelchairs, people who are bold, people who command, people who don't let storms, you just speak to the storm and tell it to stop. Man, I 
I've got a faith project going on right now. People who speak lust thus, having acknowledged they're strangers and exiles on earth, for people who speak thus make it clear they're seeking a homeland. See, what did all of the people in the Old Covenant have in common, all the heroes of faith have in common is this. They knew that heaven was their ultimate destination. It's one of the things we have to realize is that there's a heaven. And we have to become, you know, there's a phrase the world has. Here's a, here's a piece of advice for you. Any phrase the world has, just say the exact opposite and you're probably right. Don't count your chickens before they're hatched. No, count your chickens. <laughs> count them all before they're hatched. Before you even get the eggs, start to count your chickens. You go out there and count the stars. And go, ah, that's my children. That's my prosperity. That's my life. That's my blessing. That's the promise. You don't need to see any evidence at all you're going to have chickens. Seeing is believing. No. Believing is seeing. Look before you leap. No, just leap. <laughs> yeah. So the world has that little saying, doesn't it? You know, you could be so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. It's not your ability to be earthly good, it's your ability to be heavenly minded. Because if all I've got is earthly minded, and I come out of the car park, and I will come out of the car park today, and you rear end me in your car, then I, based on carnal reaction, we are unhappy about that. But when I realize that I've got a mansion in heaven, uh, in a billion years' time, is it really going to matter? I can be earthly minded and still be heavenly minded. A lady knocked down Danny years ago. He's about six years old. Came reversing out of a drive about a million miles an hour. Danny was on his scooter. We were living in a cul de sac back then. And um, she sent him flying about 10 foot. We heard him yell. Me, me and Amanda were in the back garden drinking. And we came out, and um, I, I rushed to Danny. I started praying in tongues, and he was fine. I don't know if he was just fine or praying in tongues and God's will. I don't know, but he was absolutely fine. He was going, he wanted, he wanted to go back on his skateboard. Amanda went to the lady who was in shock, prayed with him, loved him. Just what we were grace and faith. One of the days of grace and faith, Amanda put herself in the car accident. Someone's rear ended the car. I said, Okay, are you okay? Yeah, she said, Are you okay? Are the boys okay? Is the car, is the car okay? I was you know, born on the wind. I said, How's the other lady? How's the lady? Amanda said, I'm just praying with her and she kept trying to get me to come back. Some of you, you would be so carnal when someone would crash into your car. There is no way there will be a segue from that to leading that person to Jesus. I'm just letting you know that, okay? We need to become heavenly minded to be earthly good. You know, there's times God's told me to give a certain amount to a certain cause and do earthly good with the money. If all I had was earthly minded, I'd be like, I need that money. Like, I, got, I got plans for that money. But do not involve that money being separated from me. But now I'm heavenly minded, give and it shall be given, pressed down, shaken together. And then I can now be more earthly good. So these guys changed earth to give their home to God. We need to do the same. You see, back in those days, and this is important for where we're going, nobody had ever come back from the dead. No one ever came back from the dead in the book of John never happened. And yet they still believed in heaven. We have a guy, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who was crucified, declared dead by the Romans, and they knew what dead was. And they stuck a spear in his heart to double check he was dead, even though they knew he was dead. And then they mummified him. They put him in a tomb. They put a massive rock to seal the tomb, put a seal on the rock, and then sent 16 highly trained super guards to watch the tomb to make sure he was dead. My, my mother, I don't know if she still believes this, but I remember talking to her once, she believed that Jesus never actually died. 
So he just kind of was knocked out a bit by the cross and whatever else. The cross was invented by the Persians as the most vicious way to kill people. It took them years of planning. What's the nastiest way to kill people? And that's what they came up with. And um, I've said, so not only does Jesus manage to unmummify himself, which is pretty much impossible, not only did he manage to push the stone out of the way, remember, he's just come out of a coma here. He's just been crucified. Not only did he take on 16 top soldiers in the Roman army, and he would sneak past them or beat them all up, he then appeared to his disciples and looked so strong and glorious that they were convinced he was risen from the dead, to the point where every single one of them, apart from John, then later died for that truth. He said, I don't have that kind of faith. It's easier for me to believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And having rose from the dead, the only disciple who's still alive, the disciple who Jesus loved, remember this is love, not our love. They tried to boil him in oil. He just sort of did the back stroke. I'm loved by Jesus. I'm okay. And in the end, they had enough of trying to kill him, and they stuck him on an island of Patmos and said, get out of here. You just go live in that little island. And Jesus appears to him from heaven, comes to visit him, gives him a whole revelation, and in that spends two chapters, Revelation 4 and 5, telling him how wonderful heaven's going to be. And you've all got a book in your house, probably a dozen copies of it, telling you how glorious heaven is because Jesus Christ has died, gone to heaven, and come and visited John and told him about it. And Abraham believed in heaven when nobody had gone to heaven. Nobody had ever come back from the dead. And he still believed. And that belief made such an impact that it changed the whole world. Hello. They all died in faith. People just keep loving each other. Be heavenly minded. If they'd been thinking of the land from which they'd gone out, they would have had a chance to return. See, if you put your mind on something, you will always have a chance to go there. If you start thinking about adultery enough, you will have a chance to commit adultery. If you start thinking about stealing enough, there will be a chance to take something from somebody else. If you start thinking about your old life enough, you'll have a chance to go back. It's amazing how the universe shifts just when you open. So don't use your imagination for the dark stuff. Imagination for the glorious stuff, and then you'll have a way to fulfill it. If you dream of promotion enough, you'll get the promotion. If you start dreaming of a glorious ministry, dreaming of doing what God's called for you, you'll get there. If you start dreaming of what God has for you, man, you will walk in it. The door will open. Don't put your mind back to the past. Look forward. Look to heaven. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, a loving one. God is not ashamed to be called their God. God is not ashamed to be called your God. God calls you family. God calls you accepted and beloved. For he's prepared for them a city. That is going to be glorious. That is going to be wonderful. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son. Of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be known. He considered that God was able to raise him from the dead. So let's get this right. When Abraham went to offer Isaac, Abraham believed in the promises of God. And God said, through Isaac you're going to have these stars, these children. So he said, well, if God's told me to kill Isaac, then God can raise him from the dead because God can't lie. And God made a promise that through Isaac we're going to have some great kids. So God's promised me grandkids through Isaac. And now God's telling me to kill Isaac. So who cares if I kill him? God will raise him from the dead. That's faith. That's faith. They'd never seen anyone raised from the dead. He'd never read the Gospels. He'd never heard of Elijah. He knew nothing about resurrection, but he knew that God kept his promise. Let's look at it. Genesis 22. After these things, God 
tested Abraham. Let's just look at camp on that for a second. Because like a lot of things, there's ditches on both sides. There's one side of people, God will never change. And God tested Abraham. So God can test you. But the other side, which is when God tests you, that's when God makes you sick. And that's when you get sick. That's when God, you get sent to an earthquake, you get sick with that being tested as well. And um, you know, when all the money you invested didn't go pay, well, that's a test, that's not a test from God. So look at how God tested Abraham. God tested Abraham and said to him. That's how God tests you, by speaking to you. You might have been had the offering there. God said, don't, don't give 10% today. Give 30. That's a test, isn't it? be a test. You know, you're out having teas and coffee after church today, and the person opposite you says, I've just been to the doctors last week, and they've given me this really negative review. And God says, hey, you speak life. That's a test. God tests us by speaking to us. Not by giving us cancer. Not by knocking us on the floor. Not by giving us a punch in the face. God tests us by speaking to us. You see, the test isn't to help God, it's to help us. You know, Lydia's year five, she's year six next year, and she's got to have her sacks, and she's already, already they're preparing for school, she'll mentor about these things. Poor year five and year six of faith. But sacks were never supposed to be a test to the individual kid. They were supposed to be a test to the teacher to make sure the teacher was doing a good job teaching them. And so the test, you see, when, when Lydia gets the result, that result helps her when she goes to high school. So the test isn't about her. The test is about making sure she can progress and making sure that everything around her is working. So when God tests Abraham, it's not because God wants to put Abraham through a difficult time. It's because God wants Abraham to know what's in his heart. He wants Abraham to be ready to take the next level. He wants Abraham to be ready. Sometimes the greatest test God can give you is he asks you a thing. Okay? Do this a million times. What are you going to do with it? You've got to think about these things. So God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love. Go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mounts I shall tell you about. So take your son and torch him. Put a burnt offering for him. So Abraham rose early in the morning. No hesitation here. How to pass a test from God. Number one, don't hesitate. Just do it. It's amazing how many people, if you just, you know, I once, I once was at Spring Harvest years ago on a sort of sketch. I think it was Adrian Platt. And God had spoken to the, the guy in the sketch and wanted him to tell his neighbor about the love of God. And he just kept putting all these limits on it. It was quite hilarious. Well, if he walks past my house, I'll tell him. And he walks past the house. And he goes, well, if he walks past again, and he does this, and he goes on. And then it's like, if the ambassador of Japan knocks on the door at 602, wearing a rose, and then, then I'll tell him. No, just do what God tells you. Just don't hesitate. Get up early the next morning and do it. Now, Abraham said, that's the first thing. You want to pass the test from God, do it. And the second key is what we saw in Hebrews. By faith, he already received him back. If God tells you to put everything you own in the offering, God will take care of you. Now, don't do it if God doesn't tell you. But if that's the test, do what God tells you. Amanda and I pastored a church in Ipswich for a few months. It didn't work out. They weren't looking for someone who had the gifts to do it, and it's a long story. We went on holiday, came back, the locks were changed. And... Um, we went to a conference, Christian conference, the next week. And all I had in the bank was one month's rent. I was going to go home, pay the month's rent, and start looking for work. And 
and um, we're sitting in this conference and they're receiving an offering from Malawi. Uh, it's going back to when, the, when there was a flood from Malawi and drought and all sorts of stuff and famine. And God spoke to me very clearly. He said, put the whole lot in. Put that month's rent in that one. I said, hold on a minute, God. That's all I've got. And God said, well, I didn't ask for any more than that. Then I thought I could get out of it very cleverly. So that's a joint account. And I'm not telling Amanda. So God, you're going to have to tell Amanda. I'm sitting there thinking, one, big deal. And Amanda starts tapping me on her arm. And Ben, I think you need to give all the money in the bank to Ben today. And I couldn't believe it. Now I'm going to give it to Ben. So I wrote out the check. And the offering came past. I put the check in the offering. And I'm telling you, I felt so happy. Why did I feel happy? Because I realized that God had never told me that exact number. And I started to get so excited. I counted God's faithfulness. I started getting so excited. That was a test. Yeah? God didn't test me by smashing my washing machine to pieces or smacking me on the nose or giving me cancer. He tested me by giving me a simple instruction. And I would follow the simple instruction. Three days later, I was in town. I'd been offered my old job back in Wales and I was thinking about going to Wales, but God said, I want you to stay here in Stafford. And I was walking, and this whole church had been told to shun me. So if I, if I walked past one of them, they'd cross the road and not speak to me. And I saw one of the guys from the church. And he saw me and came, made a beeline for me. And I said, well, you're not towing the party line, are you? He said, I never liked them anyway. He said, well, they did you in as children. He said, how are you doing financially? I thought, that's a bit of a strange question. How are you doing financially? I said, well, I'm actually here today, you know, my best suit. I'm looking for some work. And um, that's why I'm, you know, going on the high street and trying to put myself in front of people. And um, he said, what is your monthly rent? I thought, that's a strange question. So I told him the figure, which is obviously the figure I'd given him. He said, what figure? He said, hmm. He got his checkbook out and he wrote me a check for two months. Three times what I paid. Three times what I gave him in two days. I said, that's weird. And he said, I'm now going to such and such a church. Let me keep your money. Two weeks later, I was teaching there. God has a plan for you. And when he gives you a test, it's going. So when God told Abraham, take your son, your only son, Abraham had already received. You see, it's amazing. You watch these preachers preach on this. You hear plays on it. You watch them. And it's like Abraham's so strong. No. I go off. Oh, oh. He went by faith. He was about to see someone torched and then rise from the dead. He's like, man, I wonder what this is going to look like. This is going to be an awesome day. And you see, do the maths as well. Don't think I, I, Isaac was some little kid. You do the Quran. So he was about 30 years old. And Abraham's 100 and something. So if Isaac didn't want to go, he didn't have to go. And Isaac wasn't stupid. He's like, hey, Dad, we're going to go and sacrifice the Lord. That's awesome. I see you've got a nice sharp knife, Dad. I see you've got some wood and some kindling, and we're going to start a big fire. But we are missing something. Just thinking back to all the sacrifices I've seen in my life. There's definitely something missing from this one, Dad. Oh, I know what it is. It's an animal. So what exactly are you planning to put on the altar, Dad? Ooh, son, I'm going to watch a human raised from the dead. Sorry? Just trust me, son. Okay, Dad. Saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him and Isaac, and cut the wood for the burnt offering, arose and went to the place where God had told him. There's your third key. Cut the wood. Sometimes walking in the promises of God requires hard work. Number one, do it immediately. Number two, do it in faith. What's 
God gives you a command, be prepared to do the hard work then. He, he didn't delegate. So he had 318 servants trained for war. They know how to use an axe. He could have got anybody to cut that wood. No, I'm cutting the wood myself. I'm doing this myself. Sometimes there's nothing that substitutes you just doing what God's told you to do. Put in the work in, put in the time in, put in the hours in, and cut the wood. And arose and went to the place where God had told him. There's your fourth key. When God gives you an instruction, be precise. God is not the God of thereabouts. He's a God that's very precise. When he told Elijah, I've sent the ravens to feed you there, if he went anywhere else, he wouldn't have got the food. God is very precise. So be precise when you're following God's instructions. And Abraham, God, on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. Here's our next clue. Feet tend to desire. Me and Isaac are going to go up and worship God. And then me and Isaac are coming back. Because I know my God won't fail me long. I know my God won't fail my flock. You know, and sometimes it's like we're very close to the cross. Sometimes we, I mean, Isaac was a miracle. So we've seen him, Abraham's seen a miracle. And God said through him, you're going to have the grandchildren, you're going to have the children, you're going to have all the stars in heaven. Sometimes at the very start, what God says sounds like it's going to kill the thing before it even gets in. Maybe you're believing for 10,000 pounds to do this, or maybe you're believing for the money to buy a house, and suddenly you get the right amount, or you're nearly at the right amount, and through miracles, God says, give that to that. Well, hold on a minute. You say, no, I'll give it away, but I'll still get the thing because I just want to, you know, do it the right way, and it'll happen the right way, and it'll work the right way. Trust God. And Isaac... Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it on Isaac, his son, took in his hand the fire and the knife, so both of them went together. Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father, he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So here's another thing. You don't have to reveal all of your plans to everybody. Don't worry, Isaac, God's going to provide. He didn't say, we're going to torture you, son. You are going to be the sacrifice. Don't move. Stab. No, he didn't, he didn't tell him. Sometimes it's not expedient to tell everybody. Because some people can't handle what God's told them to do. And so you tell them, maybe it's your family, I'll take family. You tell them, oh, I'm giving this much money and I'm going to believe God for this harvest. Like, are you crazy? You don't need to hear that when you're doing stuff, when your back of your head is telling you you're crazy anyway. You don't need other human beings agreeing with the voices in the back of your head going, you've got to do this, don't do this. You know, or maybe you're going to step out and you know, launch into a business. Maybe you're going to quit a job where everything's stable and secure and you've got a nice pension, but God's told you to do this. Whatever it is. Sometimes it's nice just to give people the free stuff. Well, that's already been paid for. Oh, don't worry about that, the finances. Don't worry about that, the, the medicine I'm on right now, son. You don't have to tell them, oh, I've got all the medicine, I've left the hospital for you, God told me. You don't have to tell them that, you're not going to need it. You know, if you get yourself a Ferrari, I don't know who believes in the Ferrari in these days, but if you get yourself a Ferrari, that thing's worth naught. You can drive 220 miles an hour in that Ferrari. But just because you can doesn't mean you should down Hedgeman Hill. You know? And your faith might be at the level where you can do certain things. You can, you know, quite happily torture your son and say, oh, God will be gracious to him. That's what God says. Don't do it if God doesn't say. You know, don't give away ridiculous amounts of money. Don't quit your job. Don't throw the medicine away unless you fear God. But when God speaks, it's a thing. The reason you're getting tested is 
what God wants us to do. And so God, if you, it's okay to tell people around you and Pete there, go on. I'm only here for a call. So both of them went together. When they came to a place which God had told them, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. The angel of the Lord doesn't have a stutter, by the way. One of the things people don't realize because they don't study ancient language. Hebrew, I mean, we have it great today with, you know, Microsoft Word and all that kind of stuff. You want to you highlight something. You can even highlight it. You can make it different colors. You can underline. You've got bold. You've got italics. You've got all sorts of amazing things you can do. You can make it 50-point font. You see, back in those days, they didn't have bold. They didn't have italics. So how would you emphasize? Well, they didn't even have capital letters in Hebrew. So you couldn't underline because that meant something different. It made the letters mean something different. There's nothing you could do to show emphasis. So what they did in Hebrew, in written Hebrew, to show the emphasis on a word, to make it bold, they would repeat the word. Jesus didn't say, no, everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall I enter the kingdom of heaven. He said, no, everyone who says to me, Lord, shall I enter the kingdom of heaven. When Isaiah went to heaven, he saw the cherubim praising God, and the seraphim praising God. They weren't going, holy, holy, holy. They were going, holy! You understand? It's a fantastic bit where, I think it's Jacob or Joseph, and it, he doesn't fall in a pit. He falls in a pit pit. You read it in the Hebrew. You know, his brothers didn't put him in a pit. They put him in a pit. <laughs> you know, and so the angel of the Lord didn't go, Abraham, this wasn't the time for subtlety here. You know, the guy's got a knife in his hand, about to kill his son, about to obey God and do it. And the angel of the Lord said, it's not Abraham, Abraham, but Abraham! Okay. Here I am. Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide, because the Lord will provide an answer. You see, when you're in blood covenant with someone, they do something for you just because you ask them to. Then you are now honor bound to do the same for them. So from that moment on, because Abraham offered his 30-year-old son and was prepared to have him torn, because that's what God needed of him, now God Jehovah is honor bound to torch his 30 year old son. Should that be what we need of him? And it was what we needed. And he did do it. And God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but shall have eternal life. Oh, the Lord will provide and the Lord has provided. Oh, glory. Oh, man. Here's a Greek lesson for you. When John the Baptist saw Jesus for the first time, nearly every translation I read says, Behold the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. But if you study it out, John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb. This is the promise that God gave Abraham back then. I will provide a ram for the altar. I will provide a burnt offering that will give all of his life so that you can have all of his life. He'll shed his blood 
for the redemption of it. We have to believe it. And when you realize that, and when you look at that, you see, why did Abraham offer up his own son? Because he knew how much God loved him. Because he knew that God wouldn't fail. Because he knew that God's promises were sure. Because he judged him faithful who had promised. Faith works by love. And Abraham knew how much God loved him. So his faith worked. When you realize that God loves you, that God has all your best interests at heart, God tells you to lay hands on someone who's sick. God's not trying to humiliate you. Well, what if it doesn't work? Well, what if it does? Let's go back to Hebrews 11. See that little extra quote page on that green over here. He considered that God was even able to raise him from the dead, which figuratively speaking, he did receive him back from the dead. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. One of the things I said last week is that genuine faith must be generational. It has to go from the father to the son to the grandson. It has to pass down. God is the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He's the God of all the generations. And so Abraham is the one who makes that big step of faith, that bold step of faith. He's a pioneer, first generation. And some of you are first generation. You, you, you never raised Christian. You never understood Christian. This is a first generational church. No one can have been at Tree of Life more than six years because there wasn't Tree of Life more than six years ago. Everything we do is new. And that has its bonuses. It also has some problems with it as well. But Isaac here is second generation. Some of you are second generation. Look what Isaac does. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob. You see, one of the things that faith does is it blesses your future. And so Isaac took his son and said, you're going to have a great future. And then, you know, there was a whole story about how they argued over the double portion and the blessing and whatever else. But that's not the point Paul is making here. The point he's making is this. By faith, he blessed them. And it would have taken great faith to speak life over Jacob and Esau. Because if you look at his sons, they did not have much of a godly life. You see, one of the greatest things, one of the greatest expressions of faith is can you speak life over that which does not look like it has life? When Ezekiel is taken to the valley of dry bones, God says, Son of man, prophesy life to the dry bones. Prophesy flesh and life and wind and noise and movement. It's amazing. Because most of what I see that people call themselves prophets do, when they see a bunch of dry bones, is they get up in the pulpit and go, you are a bunch of dry bones. And you're wicked. And you're very dry. And you need to stop being dry bones. And you need to be good bones. And you need to be nice if you don't repent of all your sins and turn from your wicked ways. Then God will never heal the land. Taking 2 Chronicles 7.14, a scripture which is in the obsolete covenant, and beating up people in the better covenant with it. Well, we've got to fast and pray and heal the land. That is not in the new covenant. How do we change the nation, new covenant style? Go ye into all the world and make disciples of the nation. Get out there, be salt, be light, lay hands on the sick, cast out some devils, heal some people, tell people the gospel, pray with people, love people, share your life with people, be a friend of sinners. But it's amazing how the wickeder this nation becomes, the more the prophets are saying, well, we all need to huddle together, have more prayer meetings, let's have more prayer meetings. You've got to turn from your wicked ways. No, we've already turned from our wicked ways. We got born again. We're now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Well, God needs a man to stand in the gap. Anyone know what book that's from? Ezekiel, well done. 
Why did God tell Ezekiel, I need a man to stand in the gap? Because 700 years before Christ, God needed a man to stand in the gap. And guess what? He's found one. His name's Jesus. He's standing in the gap right now. He ever lives to make intercession for us. Well, well, you don't need to stand the gap to stop God being angry at London. Jesus has already done it. God is not angry at London. His heart is to bless London. Well, London's a bit of a mess. That's because we haven't gone into all the world and made disciples yet. We're locked in our prayer closet. Do you remember a few years ago that helicopter hit the crane and fell out of the sky? A pastor of a church, a big church in London, thousands. He got on national radio and on the national Christian radio. And he said, the reason this happened is because Christians don't pray. Now, hold on a minute. You tell me, because I didn't speak to my father enough. He knocked the helicopter out of the sky and landed on someone else to teach me how to pray more. Is that how you see God? Because that helicopter didn't hit me. He said, what we need to do, he said, every Christian needs to get up at three in the morning and pray for three hours every day. That's what it, I thought, if every Christian in London gets up at 3 a.m. and prays for three hours every day, there will be more accidents in London, not less. We live in a better covenant. We don't have to beg God to heal the land. We have the healing power inside us. I've lost track of where I was. See, faith speaks blessing. There's no dry bones repaired. You got this, you got that. It says life. You're the righteousness of God. You've got the life of God inside you. You might look like a bunch of dry bones, but I'm telling you, you're going to make it. You're going to be the greatest church in this town. You're going to love people who are unlovely. You're going to heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers. You are going to make disciples of nations. That's what faith speaks. Because I'm fully persuaded in God. 